Thank you. Wow. Geez, I was going to say all kinds of like scandalous things about Larry, but after that introduction, I can't now. All I can say is I'm, I'm very honored by the opportunity to be able to present in this particular session and also to have uh, Larry introduce me. Um, and I think it's very, very, very safe to say that, um, how can I put it? There's a renewed competency and vision and energy and achievement on behalf of Parker. And I want to just have us all acknowledge that this has been one hell of a program that has been transformational in nature, and I believe that the path forward is going to be extraordinary here. <clears throat> So my sincere appreciation, I, I know what it takes to try to do something like this, and I've been coming here for many, many, many years, and wow, did they just, did they just deliver this time. So I'm, I'm really extremely um, humbled and honored to be here on this stage right now to have this conversation. Uh, Larry brought up the concept or the, the subject of philosophy. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, philosophy is one of the most adrenaline-charged terms within our profession today. It's kind of this interesting thing. When you hear the word philosophy, what is conjured up in your mind? What is it that, that, that you think about? Are you thinking about like old guys in robes you know, that walk the earth in antiquity? Uh, are you thinking about um, you know, abstract stuff that has really no practical application in real life? It's been a polarizing subject within this profession and I believe that the, the rhetoric around it, the angst that it's created, the infighting that has been a byproduct of philosophy has been completely misguided. Case in point, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia some years ago, and I'm at a, a meeting, uh, and there were some members of uh, the Board of Chiropractic Examiners in the state of Georgia, which I won't name, and uh, we're having a conversation, and one of them says, philosophy, uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't think we should give continuing education credit in the state of Georgia for that philosophy stuff, as he put it. And I said, do you even know what the word means? And he said, well, you know, philosophy, you know, that, that philosophy stuff that they teach at, you know, some of those schools, those schools. And I said, can you define the term philosophy for me? Can you tell me the branches of philosophy? Can you tell me branch by branch how they apply to chiropractic or to healthcare in general? I said, can you tell me anything about the subject of philosophy? Do you realize that the position you're taking right now is a philosophical position? You are so intellectually impotent that you don't even know what the word means, yet you're trying to assert that chiropractors in the state of Georgia, which I have a license there, should not get continuing education credit for courses in philosophy. And quite frankly, I, I'm, uh, well, I'm not going to hold anything back here. I, I have z zero tolerance for intellectual incompetence that tries to orchestrate agendas within the profession that would limit what chiropractors can do to get their service to their communities to help people who so desperately need it. Every single human being has a philosophy. Ladies and gentlemen, each and every one of you in this audience right now has a philosophy. The only question is whether you defined it and you're conscious of it and you act upon it or if it's accumulated in your subconscious in some kind of an unrealized way. What holds us back? What paralyzes us? I recently did a TEDx talk on the subject of philosophy. And the conclusion of my talk was this. I don't believe that there are lazy people. I believe there are paralyzed people. And what paralyzes them is that they have contradictions in a philosophy that they don't even know they possess. Why do we get stuck? Why do I see chiropractors, rather than having 15 or 20 years of experience, they have one year experience 20 times? Repetitive 
treadmill type experience where they're just trying to keep up, just trying to keep it going, and they don't make any progress. They're not evolving, they're not emerging, they're not trending, they don't have traction. Why would that be? What prevents us to, to break through, to go to new levels, to take a vision and a purpose that we have and take it to new and better places on an ongoing, as, a, as an ongoing process? One of my most important philosophical premises that I've adopted, which comes from the philosopher Ayn Rand, was this. Contradictions lead to destruction. The amount of destruction is relative to the level of the contradiction. Contradictions lead to destruction. The amount of destruction is relative to the level of the contradiction. When we have contradictions in our philosophical premises, it leads to destruction. When we have contradictions in the driving forces of our lives, it leads to destruction. For a moment. Imagine that what's driving you, the driving forces, which incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, are your values. Imagine that they're pulling you in this direction. And what's driving you in your, and that's your career driving forces, they're pulling you this way. What's driving you in your personal life, however, seems to be pulling you this way. So what happens? You start out and you start moving, and both are moving. Your career is moving, your personal life is moving, and instantly you have your spiritual life moving in a direction, your financial life moving in a direction, your family life, your relationship life moving in a direction. It's not just these two directions, it's multiple directions, 360 degrees all around you. But imagine all these things start moving, and you start, hey, I'm getting to go this way, I'm getting to go this way, and it starts going out, 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 till you get to a point of what? Maximum tension. How many people here know something? Well, maybe I'll, I'll back up one step. How many people here would like to see that their practice or life improves somehow when they go home on Monday? Show of hands. Kind of a dumb question, right? I mean, I, well, let me, well, let me ask this. How many people here showed up and said, you know, I gotta go to this program because my life is a little too good, I want to suck a little more so I can take it down a notch because I can't take it anymore, it's just too good, right? We have any of those? All right, so I have to imagine that you are people who get on airplanes, pay money, show up to, to have an agenda in part that says that I want to lead me to higher ground. I have, a, I have a, uh, an inclination or a motivation towards improvement in my life. So if that's the realm, let me ask this. How many people here know something that you could be doing that you're currently not doing that would make your life better? The rest of you are lying. Everybody knows something right now that you could be doing that you're currently not doing that would make your life better. So this is kind of a curious thing, right? You know things you could be doing to make your life better. You have an intention to even show up at programs and pay money and time and energy to find new ways to make your life better, but you don't do them. So I guess another question is, why did you come here to learn more about what you're not gonna do? So, the really the more fundamental question is, what is it that prevents us from taking action on the things that we know would make things better? And it's this. It's contradictions and driving forces in your life. Within the branches of philosophy, you have the first branch, which is metaphysics, your view of the nature of reality, your view of the nature of the universe. In essence, metaphysics asks the question, where am I? What is this place? What is the nature of reality? If you narrow the field of metaphysics to something like chiropractic, saying what is the chiropractic metaphysical view? What is our view of the nature of reality? The body is self-healing and self-regulating. Is that a premise held by chiropractic? Yes or no? The nervous system is the master system and controller of that body. Another premise that we hold, right? So then we get into the second branch of philosophy, which is epistemology, the theory of knowledge. What do we accept as evidence or proof a whole other conversation that gets my adrenaline flowing. So we do a deduction, what would be referred to as a deduction when we say that the body is self-healing and self-regulating, the nervous system is the master system and control of that body. Therefore, if you interfere with nervous system function, you must then necessarily what? Interfere with the ability for the body to heal and regulate. So you start to see how you can start to build out philosophical premises, run them through your rules of evidence, and then from the third branch of philosophy, which is ethics, which provides a human being with a code of values and therefore will be a guide to your actions, you now create your values and say, what do I do? Where am I? How do I know? What do I do? That's pretty much how easy philosophy can be 
as a structure. Here's the thing that people don't get. Philosophy is not just some kind of an abstract academic exercise that people do you know, on weekends when they're wearing their suede patches on their sleeves, but then Monday has no practical application into their life. My premise is this, philosophy is the most practical thing a human being can hope to embrace. I'm talking about put dollars in your pocket practical. I'm talking about upgrading your relationships practical. I'm talking about increasing your health and energy practical. In every possible way, philosophy, there's nothing more foundational, nothing more practical than philosophy. Yet, we don't utilize it. I, some, somebody like that comment? Okay. I <laughs> wasn't looking for applause and quite frankly wasn't sure why it was there, but thank you. Um, so, the, but the point is, is that we don't utilize philosophy as a tool for achievement. In chiropractic, collectively as a profession, our philosophy is our tool for achievement. Not the thing that, as is asserted, what's holding our profession back is philosophy. No, you idiot, it's the thing that makes us strong. It's the thing that gives us a unique character. Philosophy gives us our brand, our understanding. I have zero patience for people who try to assert that philosophy is something that is injurious to the chiropractic profession, injurious to the chiropractor. So the idea is to embrace philosophy not to shun it, is to understand philosophy, not to ignore it, and to utilize philosophy. You want to have meetings on any level that are practical, that are visionary, that are formative, it has to start with what are our premises? Why do we hold these premises? Now what are we going to do? Because when you have contradictions in your basic philosophical premises, the only possible result is destruction. When you get the maximum tension, you get stuck. There's nowhere for you to go. You can know all the stuff in the world, the new stuff to do, but it's not getting in the system because the system's at maximum tension. So you have to take a step back now and you have to say, hmm, where is the conflict between what I do personally, what I do professionally, what I do spiritually, what I do monetarily, and how can I take a step back and rather than having contradictory values, which come from my philosophy, how can I start to organize these in a common direction? So if you go from here to here, and now you put something new into the system, it takes off. That's where breakthroughs happen. A while back, I tweeted something. I, you, see me, you see me get caught when I say I tweeted? How, do you, how, do you, how are you supposed to feel masculine and say that word? Somebody explain that one to me. I mean, am I the only one that has a problem with that? <laughs> I did something on Twitter. I don't tweet. All right, I tweeted. So I tweeted this. Sorry, it's my own hang up, I'll have to research it. All right, so, <laughs> I said, a sure way to know that you've got contradictions, because you say, well, how do I know if I have contradictions? How do I try to identify them? A sure way to know if you've got contradictions is if right now you're sitting with the sentiment that where I am is not who I am. Do you understand what I'm saying to you right now? Where you feel like, if I look at my life and where I am in my life, it doesn't, when I think about who I am, or I have this concept of who I am, it doesn't match up. Where I am is not who I am. And that's the time to say, then you have contradictions that are preventing the expression of who you are. And the tool that solves that is philosophy. Do you understand the relationship between philosophy and new patients? Do you understand the relationship between philosophy and money? Do you understand the relationship between philosophy and patient retention? Do you understand the relationship between philosophy and marketing? 
Do you understand the relationship between philosophy and everything in your practice? Do you understand the relationship between philosophy and parenting? Do you understand the relationship between philosophy and love relationships? Philosophy touches every single part of your life in profound ways. And again, if we become conscious of it, it becomes transformative. In the chiropractic context, it's our philosophy that gives us the foundation of our three C's, confidence, certainty, and credibility. Confidence, certainty, and credibility. When we don't have philosophy, what do we want? Acceptance from the medical profession. Acceptance from people who don't share our philosophy. That makes no sense to me. And then we, you know, people prattle about, well, we all have to practice evidence-based medicine. There's only evidence for this. I can remember being, I've been in nine public debates over this. And sitting across other chiropractors in front of an audience, having a debate over this particular issue. Chiropractors can't make claims about subluxation. Subluxation hasn't been proven. Of course, I ask the one question they hate. You know what it is? What will you accept as proof? Ooh. Now I'm forcing them into a philosophical position. Second branch, epistemology. What will you accept as proof? There are no randomized controlled clinical trials. I've told you the Barrett story when I had to debate with him. Right? This, is, this is a philosophical conversation even though some people maybe not recognize it. When we're at this debate and he leans over to me because it was a pediatric conference, he says, how can chiropractors possibly see children? And you just want to jump up and choke the shit out of them. Right? Uh, <laughs> did I just say that? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to try to be restrained. <sighs> but keeping calm, I just looked and said, well, Dr. Barrett, why would you have a problem with chiropractors seeing children? Well, there is no scientific evidence proving the efficacy of chiropractic for children. Well, Dr. Barrett, um, what would you accept as scientific evidence? Well, there are no randomized controlled clinical trials proving the efficacy of chiropractic for children. So rather than you know, trying to be a walking encyclopedia of the refereed literature and spouting out a bunch of studies, which I'm not, I mean, I, do, I know some studies, but you can't know them all. I just looked at him, I said, well, Dr. Barrett, didn't you have heart bypass surgery about five years ago? He looked kind of shocked. Google's a beautiful thing. You know, you never, wa never walk into these situations cold, right? Do a little prep. And he kind of looked a little surprised, said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. I said, well, there are no randomized controlled clinical trials showing the efficacy of heart bypass surgery for people with cardiovascular disease. Why did you decide to do that? He goes, well, hmm, contradiction, right? That's a very clever argument. However, the artery that I had clogged is called the Widowmaker. And if I didn't have that surgery, I wouldn't be sitting here today. God, that's a moral conflict, isn't it? Um, I always like Dr. Kent's you know, uh, orientation. We, Dr. Kent and I would sit around sometimes, and then he, we would you know, kind of speculate a little and fantasize, and he used to say, you know, if God would give me just one karma-free hit, who would it be? And we'd, we'd debate, you know, who should it be and the implications. It, we were just, of course, it, yeah, we weren't serious. But it's fun. It's fun to think about. <laughs> Kidding. So anyway, and I said to him, you know this how? How do you know this? He said, well, uh, you know, uh, this vessel, you know, was the main blood supply of the heart. I said, so what you're telling me is that the heart is a vital organ, and it's also a muscle. And to function, it requires oxygen. The oxygen's carried through the blood. If not enough blood with oxygen gets to the heart, you'll have a heart attack and die. That what you're saying is a highly invasive, high-risk, rip your chest open surgery, saved your life, and you're concluding that based on 
your knowledge of anatomy and physiology and biology that you deductively concluded this, not through randomized controlled clinical trials. I said, and that is exactly the same reason why chiropractors should see children. You cannot have it both ways, sir. And there's nowhere to go from there. You know, this evidence-based stuff, I have people saying, oh, well, you know, the only thing that's been published, randomized controlled clinical trials, the only evidence for chiropractic is, you know, for low back pain, uncomplicated low back pain, that's the only thing that's been published that we have the right kind of research for, et cetera. And I pull out the studies, I'm looking at these guys, I said, uh, can you, which studies are you referring to? Oh, this one over here? Well, let me look at this. They don't define the type of intervention, the level of intervention, the frequency of intervention. You know, they just crank on them. You're going to tell me that that is a well-controlled study that you think you would be confident in resting the entire reputation of the profession on that? Really? And then I'd say, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you ever adjust the thoracic spine? Oh, sure, I do in my office every day. Where's the RCT for that? Oops. Contradiction, contradiction, contradiction. The problem is that we've accepted a more burdensome standard for what we do than what goes on out there with much higher risk interventions. Why did we accept that? Why do we bow to that? Why do we shake? The, you know, when you look at the evidence that supports subluxation-based chiropractic care, it's not just deduction, body is self-healing and self-regulating, and nervous system is mess the system and control that body, therefore if you interfere with nervous system function, you interfere with the ability for the body to heal and regulate. It's not just that. It's not just induction, which we have, which are randomized controlled clinical trials showing the efficacy of chiropractic in many situations. And incidentally, on the RCTs, one of the things I'll tell you, what do we have? RCTs of chiropractic and headache. RCTs of chiropractic and dysmenorrhea. RCTs of chiropractic and back pain. RCTs in chiropractic and uh, uh, numerous types of conditions, musculoskeletal or organic. But here's the thing, and this is the thing that you must understand, which is a foundational premise in chiropractic, that if you don't get this, you stay a little bit in conflict and, and, a, little, and a lot in contradiction. Regardless of condition, the intervention is what? The adjustment. We don't have the headache adjustment versus the dysmenorrhea adjustment versus the infantile colic adjustment, do we? Regardless of the condition, the influence of the adjustment is as wide as the influence of the nervous system. So we don't have to get into this whole, oh, we need to test every disease in the Merck manual to substantiate what we do. But we do have very solid foundations deductively. We do have inductive research which further supports those deductive foundations. We also have outcome assessment, which is what I dedicated a couple of decades of my life to, developing the Insight Subluxation Station with Dr. Christopher Kent. Why? Because I found myself in practice selling a product I wasn't sure I was delivering. I found the contradiction in my practice was that I'm selling this thing called spinal correction, improved health for improved neural performance, that we don't rely on symptoms to determine if you need care or not, but my testing and evaluation foundations were steeped in traditional medical, orthopedic, and neurological testing. Which incidentally, I was teaching in diplomate programs. It's not that I didn't know this stuff. I could tell you the 12 cranial nerves, whether sensory motor are mixed, what the forehead will test them, deep tendon reflexes, superficial reflexes, pathological reflexes, what nerves go to what organs for what segmental levels of the spine, several orthopedic tests I could probably tell you. I haven't done them in a long time, but I could think about probably and remember many of them. And I could tell you that if you're relying on those tests to determine whether or not your patients need an adjustment, there's a lot of people walking out of your office not getting the care they need. So it's a contradiction. If you wonder why, I mean, think about it. What most chiropractors tell me, my vision is a lifetime family wellness care practice. That's what I want. What I've got is a back and neck pain center. What lies in the gap between vision, what you want, and reality, what you've got, what lies in that gap is contradiction. And the bigger the contradiction, the wider the gap. And as you start to eliminate contradictions and act congruently, in your life and practice, you start to see the gap closing until you get to a point where you're living your vision. You think philosophy's got some power and influence? You better believe it because that's how you find that stuff out. That's what it's all about. So how would you go, how would you go apply this? I mean, think about it. Uh, let's, one of the big issues I see in chiropractic 
is the issue of money. Here's a really tough contradiction for a lot of people to get over. I got involved in chiropractic for humanitarian reasons. I want to help people. However, I've got a problem because I just don't want to have to deal with the money. I don't want to have to deal with the finances. Somehow from your, as Larry would teach me, your mother's, father's, teachers, preachers growing up, what did you learn? Rich people are thieves, don't bite off more than you can chew, don't try to be something you're not, etc. You learn that you want to become selfless in your service. And I think there's a couple of contexts to that. But if you don't define what you mean by selfless, it could be problematic. You cannot really be, for example, in a for-profit business and simultaneously be altruistic. Selfless. What does selfless mean? Less than self. What's profit? Profit means that there's a gain. No gain, no profit. Selfless means there is no gain. It's selfless. It's an action from which you derive no gain, as where profit is an action from which you derive a gain. You cannot simultaneously be, be profitable and be selfless. So what a lot of chiropractors do, they become marginally selfless. They're selfless enough to just get through week by week, month by month, praying for another insurance check to come in the mail to try to make rent. And they, and they get into this, this frustrated situation. They want to help people. You want to help you. The best way to help the poor, here's a premise for you, the best way to help the poor is to not be one of them. You can't be in a for-profit business and simultaneously be a charity. Now, I am not saying don't be charitable. I am a big believer in charity. I think charity works. It works a whole lot better in government. So I believe, yeah. <clears throat> I believe in charity, but your business can't be a charity. You can't be for-profit and charitable all at the same time. So how do you resolve that? You understand the exchange of values. What's your philosophy about money? How do you define money? What is money? How do you define it? Well, I mean, materially, what is money? It's just paper, right? Materially, but what does it represent? What does this represent? <laughs> it represents what? What I owe Larry. Probably a little bit more than that. <laughs> Security. What else? Values. What else? Choice. Power. It represents a lot of good. I'm hearing positive things about money. But let me have you understand something. If I took you and put you on a beach in a deserted island with a billion, with a B, dollars cash on the beach, there you are alone with it, what good's the money? You gonna eat it? You gonna shelter you? Are you gonna sit there and count the money every day? No, you wash up on that beach, what's the first thing you're doing? You're going to look for shelter, look for food, and try to create an environment for which you can live and survive. The money is meaningless. Money has no inherent value unless there is something produced of value to trade for it. It's a means of exchange. Now, I will tell you, money makes civilization as we know it possible. It used to be, hey, you know, I raise chickens. Hey, uh, I make shoes. Hey, I build houses. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Um, I need a new pair of shoes. How many chickens? Uh, five. Okay, here's five chickens. I'll get my new shoes. Hey, I, I need a new, ho a new house. Uh, how many chickens? I don't want that many chickens. Well, what do you need? Uh, uh, okay, here's a list of all the stuff I want. Go trade your chickens for all that stuff. Bring it back, and I'll build you a house. It's completely inefficient. Some human beings got smart and said, yeah, you know, we can create these coins and we can make them a medium of exchange to accelerate how we can all specialize in the area of our own strengths. So, because if I have to make, you know, shoes and build houses and raise chickens and do all these things, some of them I might be good at, some of them I might not be good at. So why, wouldn't it be better if I could spend all day focusing on something that I love and that I'm good at and let other people focus on other things? And then we can have this thing called a currency that lets us exchange with each other. And from that, now we can build a culture that adds value. So you have to decide if you're going to be a producer, somebody who creates values in excess of what they consume, or a consumer, somebody who takes out more than they put in. What do you think is morally right? Money, however, 
is the thing that facilitates all transactions. It's a good thing. You know, people say, oh, money is evil. No, 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 it's not that. The love of money is the root of all evil. Really? But what is money? I mean, it's kind of a big crowd, and maybe I should be a little shy about admitting this, but I love it. I mean, they call it cold, hard cash. I think it's kind of soft and warm, especially it's been in my pocket for a while. But, and I, when I talk to theologians about that, you know, said, you know, about that passage, they say, it really is misinterpreted. What they're saying is the lust for money is the root of all evil. See, loving something implies something else. When you love something, it means you respect it, doesn't it? When you love something, it means you admire it. When you love something, it means that you feel you, you want to embrace it. When you lust for it, it means you want to get the undeserved. What the root of all evil is, and what I translate that for myself, the implication is for people who try to get money without deserving it, people who try to get money without adding value, people who try to get money who don't deserve it, who haven't done anything for it, that's the root of all evil. But people who produce and create value in the world and as a result exchange that value for money, the money is a representation of how much value you're bringing. I could tell you that if you're a millionaire chiropractor and you've been in practice for some years, my conclusion isn't, oh man, you must be some kind of a liar, cheater, you rip people off. My conclusion is you must have helped a lot of people. So what kind of a chiropractor do you want to be? But nothing is more heartbreaking to me than seeing chiropractors for years in, in practice working hard with good intentions and ending up broke and frustrated. And the contradictions that they held that they don't even know that they have starting to cause a degeneration in their psychology which leads them on this downward spiral to a point where they kind of throw their hands up, they complain about the world, and the next thing you know, they are disengaged, miserable, and they maybe are working only because they have to, not because they have a purpose. That's what contradictions do. So, what can you do to maybe improve this? How can you maybe translate this into something that you can take home in a practical way? And that's really my, my whole hope here, is that we can translate this into practical application for you. That you can start to utilize philosophy as a tool for your achievement, as it should be. That you can not only embrace philosophy as a chiropractor and refine your chiropractic philosophy, but you can also utilize philosophy as a tool for your growth and expansion as a human being in general. That you can be a better parent, that you can be a better spouse, that you can be a better everything, that you can use it to improve your health, your energy levels, your bank accounts, your spirituality, in all the ways that it can and should be done. And it's not an easy thing. You, can, you don't just wake up and say, okay, you know, I snap my fingers and something. You have to, if you want to do this, it requires your effort, it requires thinking. Basically, I utilize philosophy as an algorithm from which to process my thinking. If I'm viewing something, if I'm assessing something, I run it through philosophy. What I call, and what I've developed called the philosophy formula. I put things through the philosophy formula. What do I believe? What's my premise? Why do I believe it? What am I going to do about it? If um, philosophyformula.com, there's a free training that's going to be coming out in that in about two weeks. So if you go there and just opt in, philosophyformula.com, I'll have three free videos on it. You can go there if you want to dig deeper into some of these areas. I obviously don't have the time here. But ultimately, I think chiropractors get this close, but they, they miss one thing. How many people here would say they're on purpose? Raise hands. It's hard for me to see, but the lights are very bright. So you have a purpose, and purpose is important. And Dr. Kent and I created On Purpose Audio for over 20 years we've been doing it. I believe in purpose as a foundation for how we achieve in life. I believe, you know, I was watching this movie on, on the way over on the plane, and the one of the main characters says to the other main character, what does every human being want? What do you think every human being wants? And the, person th the other person thinks about it and says, um, I'm not sure, love? And the person looks at him and says, no, a purpose. And it's true. But there is no purpose without what? Philosophy. Your purpose comes from your philosophy. That's where it emerges out of. So I want to just briefly cover 
the five steps from philosophy to prosperity to see the practicality of how all this comes together. There are five P's basically that lead you there. The first P is philosophy, which we've been talking about and I think that we've given a pretty good amount of, of uh, orientation toward. Out of that third branch of philosophy, remember the first branch, metaphysics, where am I? The second branch, epistemology, how do I know? Third branch, ethics, so now what do I do? So purpose is really your moral compass, isn't it? It's your ethics, it's your values. You can't just say, well, I have these values, why do you have them? Because there's some foundational view of reality that you have and some way that you know or you conclude on that view, therefore now you have values. These values then orchestrate your purpose or emerge into your purpose. So there is no purpose unless there's first philosophy and if you understand philosophy you can clarify your purpose on a higher level. And I've seen practices literally double just from getting a little bit more focused on their statement of purpose. Change nothing else. Because most people, here's what most people are thinking right now. Well, you know, can you tell me how to do a better report of findings? That will help my practice. Can you tell me how to do a better consultation? That will help my practice. Not there's contradictions down below. Perceive, if I teach you all the exact same marketing procedure right now, and you all go out and flawlessly execute it exactly the way that I teach it, do you realize that you're going to all get different results with it? It's not the procedure that gets the result, it's who the person is doing the procedure that gets the result. And who you are comes from your philosophy. So you start down there. I'm not saying procedures aren't important, and I'll show you why in a moment. So you start with philosophy and you go to purpose. Purpose is the object for which something exists. So if it's the purpose of your practice, it's, the, purpose, it's the, the reason your practice exists. It is the reason that you exist if it's your own personal purpose. Purpose is the object for which something exists. What makes you different than every other form of animal on the planet is the fact that you can choose a purpose. A dog cannot choose a purpose for its life. If it could, it probably would not live with you. Right? You think I'm kidding. <laughs> a cow could not choose a purpose for its life. If it could, there'd be no such thing as McDonald's. What makes you uniquely human is the fact that you can choose a purpose. Why? Because we have a prefrontal cortex. We can think abstractly. We have the capacity for abstract conceptualization, which means we can think about our, our history behind us, our ancestry behind us. We can think about the legacy that we want to leave. We can think about our lives abstractly and then as a result take action on it. If you don't have a purpose, then you're living like every other form of animal on the planet in a thing called survival, in a thing called pain pleasure. So what happens? You will constantly move away from pain and try to move towards pleasure with no direct compass saying, I go in this direction, but you're just trying to survive it day to day, week to week, month to month which is what every other animal does. That's a condition referred to as mediocrity. And it's 80 plus percent of humanity lives that way. They don't have a clearly defined purpose. They don't act upon it. Their only hope is to try to survive this chaotic flux that they have no context for in philosophy called life on planet Earth in this particular universe. However, when you have a purpose, and this is where I disagree with some of the self-help gurus. Oh, everything's pain pleasure. You, you, you know, I, can, I can identify every action that you take, every decision you make is either moving toward pleasure or away from pain and that's why you do it. That is wrong. It's the wrong way to live. When you have purpose, pain and pleasure are gonna come and go on an alternating basis, isn't it? Don't we always experience some pain, some pleasure along the path? but your constant companion is this thing called purpose. That's what gets you through the pain. That's what gets you to celebrate the pleasure. But purpose is the constant companion and it emerges from your philosophy. So your, your philosophy and your purpose are cause. That causes every other outcome in your life. Three effects. The first effect is psychology. This is another thing. We have too many self-help junkies in the world, right? They go, they get pumped up, they take the new program, they come out to a new seminar and they're pumped up, they go back to their offices, they're doing great for a couple of weeks, and then what happens? Uh, crash. Okay, let's go to the next one. We're up and we're down, we're up, we're down, and there's this roller coaster ride going, I call it our merry-go-round, it's the self-help junkie. 
Why? Because if you try to just manipulate your emotions without changing anything about your foundational philosophy, you're always going to get dragged back down to your premises, your contradictions, and you're going to always go to that level and you're going to be frustrated. Why do I keep coming back? Why do I seem like I'm making traction and then I keep coming down? Because the contradictions in your foundational philosophy are holding you there. And until you change that, there's no breakthrough. So they become self-help junkies. They have the desire. That's why they keep reading the books, listening to the programs, coming out to the seminars. But they don't break through. Up, down, up, down. Emotions are secondaries, they're not primaries. Emotions are responses to your philosophical premises. Or another way to say it, your, your psychological experiences are a byproduct of your philosophical premises. It's premise first, emotion second. Case in point. <clears throat> Let's say that what I have here, center stage, is a newborn infant and a whole lineup of needles to give that kid some vaccine. <laughs> Several of them, right out of the box, no pun. Now, over here, that was really bad. I didn't mean it that way. So. You guys laughed and I realized what I just said. All right, so over here, let's say that we have a traditional pediatrician observing that infant being vaccinated. And over here, let's say that we have a traditional chiropractor watching that infant being vaccinated. So you got two grown human beings simultaneously watching the exact same thing at the exact same time and they both are accurately perceiving what's going on, correct? Now, what's the emotional experience of the pediatrician watching this? Happy, oh, good, another one saved. <laughs> what's the emotional experience of the chiropractor watching this? <clears throat> Horror. So how is it that two sentient adult beings who have advanced degrees in education can watch the identical thing, the exact same thing at the identical time and have completely opposing emotional reactions to it. What's the difference between the two of them? Philosophy. Your philosophical premises will shape your psychological experiences. It doesn't mean that if you know your philosophy that you're happy all the time, but when you're not, you know why. When you have mixed emotions, when you're sitting there saying like you have like conflicting emotions around things, you know what that means? Contradiction. There's a contradiction somewhere that makes you feel kind of both ways about something as compared to clarity of your values based on your premises that give you clean conclusion. Incidentally, we're not perfect folks. We're never contradiction free. We're never purely con contradiction free. E advancement in life is removing contradictions over time to get there. Okay, so we have philosophy, purpose is cause. The first effect is psychology. The second effect is procedure. Now procedures get plugged in. Why? Imagine if your procedures are in contradiction with your purpose. You see? Procedures are necessary to get to prosperity, but they don't cause it. They manage the effects. It is philosophy and purpose that are cause. You, you, procedures need to properly and congruently manage the effect. So when you go in and say, okay, I want to make my practice better, fix my practice, grow my practice, my relationship, my parenting, whatever it is, and you want to do it through new procedures, if you don't deal with what's down here at the foundation, which is philosophy and purpose, the new procedures don't really help you. If you're seeing X amount of patients per day, 20 patients a day, and you learn new procedures, maybe you'll get better at seeing 20 a day. <laughs> you're not going to go to 40, 60, 80, 100, or wherever it is you want to be, unless you work down here first, and then you work towards those outcomes. Now, if the procedure is the only thing holding you back, meaning the contradiction in procedure is the only thing holding you back, then they would be a breakthrough. Short of that, they are not. So if you line up your philosophy, your purpose, your psychology, and your procedures, now the ultimate effect of all those things is prosperity. That's when prosperity occurs. Now, you'd say, okay, that's great. I want to be prosperous. When I say prosperity, I'm not just talking about money. I'm also talking about spiritual wealth. Here's the biggest contradiction I know about prosperity, about money. 
people think that material wealth and spiritual wealth are all are on two sides of a continuum. That as I move towards material wealth, I have to necessarily move away from spiritual wealth. And as I move towards spiritual wealth, I must necessarily move away from material wealth. Okay, so pick one. Which would you rather be, materially wealthy or spiritually wealthy? Would you rather be a liar or a sucker? Right? I mean, isn't that one hellish contradiction? It's one of the worst contradictions that plagues human beings and undermines their experience on this planet. <laughs> The fact that they believe they have to choose either spiritual or material wealth, that they can't have both because they're on opposite sides of a continuum. What I'm here to tell you is that that's a faulty premise that's a full contradiction that keeps people either broke or corrupt. Material wealth and spiritual wealth are not opposing forces. And I had, my epiphany came when I was reading Einstein's book on relativity where he said, what my equation demonstrates, and I always say, you know, I always say this, you know, wouldn't it be cool to have an equation? Would you like to say what my equation demonstrates? I'd like to be able to do that. My wife now tells me, because I created an equation for philosophy formula, I have an equation, but I don't think it's quite E equals MC squared. So, what my equation demonstrates is that matter and energy are both manifestations of the same thing. Matter and energy are both manifestations of the same thing. Hmm. What do you mean? E equals mc squared. E is energy. M is matter. Energy is equal to matter times c, the speed of light squared, 186,000 miles per second, big number. But there is a relationship between matter and energy that they both are manifestations of the same thing. E, energy, spiritual. M, matter, material. Spiritual wealth and material wealth are not opposing forces. They're both manifestations of the same thing. If you're living on purpose, if you're adding value to the world and you're being rewarded materially, you're also being rewarded materially. Some people say, what about Mother Teresa? Mother Teresa took a vow of poverty and, and look at her spiritual wealth. Listen, Mother Teresa flew around this earth on private jets. I, I don't fly on private jets. Oh yeah, but she didn't own them. Hey, listen, if somebody wants to give me access to a private jet to go anywhere in the world whenever I want, you know, um, and I don't hold title to the jet, I'm cool with that. I'm fine. It's okay. The strength of Mother Teresa's purpose was so strong, she attracted the material wealth to her necessary to actualize that purpose. When your purpose is strong, you will attract the material resources necessary to make that purpose a reality in the world. If your purpose and you are full of contradictions, then you don't attract. It doesn't come in. But when you get focused and clear on what your purpose is, and you're vibrating at that frequency, you start attracting it to you. When you attract it to you, now you money to you is not a means of quitting what you do. If you say, well, if I had this much money, I'd stop doing it. I called the $5 million question. If I gave you $5 million bucks right now, are you going back to work on Monday? The chiropractor said to me after I asked him that question, once he thought about it, he said, yeah, to tell the patients I won't be back for a really long time. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, and that's why you'll never have $5 million bucks. If money becomes a means of stopping what you're doing, if money becomes a means to stop your purpose, you're never going to have the money. But if you said, oh, if I had $5 million, maybe sure, upgrade your lifestyle, better house, better car, better vacations, whatever. But if you start to think, man, what I could do to expand my practice, to add associates, and now money becomes a means of expanding the range of your vision, of your purpose, of what you want to create in the world. And when that is authentic and real, you will attract to you the material resources to make that a reality. So you, I've seen people who are holding contradictions like I'm talking about money, material wealth, spiritual wealth. They're they straighten those things out, and the next thing you know, they soar. So it becomes a process and an important one. I have a closing thought I want to share with you. I mean, just, I could go on for hours about this, and I, you know, uh, I do all over the place all the time. <laughs> uh, I have a passion around it. It's my purpose. And so often, you know, this is one of the things that I discovered, you know, actual potential holdings. We have a lot of holdings, all of which are aligned with our values. We're values-based. One of which you know, is, is a free service that uh, I'd like to uh, invite you to go to is the circleofdocs.com. Go there. 
Uh, it's it's a, my partner, uh, Dr. Bo Pierce, who's the founder, is over here, and I have to tell you that uh, a very impressive young second-generation chiropractor that I've absolutely loved working on this project with. But it's a platform from which to disseminate, one place to go for everything chiropractic, but in the principle and in, in, in the right consciousness of what chiropractic is. It's a free service to chiropractors. So there's nothing to sell you. Go there, become a community member. I want to commune with the world of chiropractic and get good content out on an ongoing basis with a drumbeat that chiropractors can engage in. We've got, we're only out a month and a half. We've got over 30,000 page views a month from 90 different countries, and it's just going to go like this. It's, it, it's leveraging technology that has almost you know, zero marginal cost into the world so that we can do something big for this profession. So please become a part of it. Philosophy is the root. Prosperity is the fruit. You've got to have the roots if you want the fruit. So I'm going to read to you what I was going to open with <laughs> and leave you with this. And I also just want to say one thing before I do. This man sitting over here, I'm going to try not to cry, Dr. Larry Markson has meant, he's going to be closing today, and he's meant so much to me. Um, I, you know, we all need mentors. We all need people that inspire us, that teach us that make us better human beings, that dust us off once in a while when we need to get picked up. And I've just watched this chiropractic giant over the years who, when I was a fledgling chiropractor, taught me about integrity and success and headspace, and he's about to teach you. And it's just so amazing that this many years later, I could sit and still listen and still be inspired and learn from him. And I, I think he's been a gift to this profession. I, quite frankly, I think his presentations are better now than they ever were. He keeps saying, my time has passed. I think he's full of crap. Um, I, and I think that he's got a lot more to contribute. And uh, I, I, you know, there's going to be a video introducing him, so I don't get to. But all I can say is that I love you, Larry. I, I congratulate you for the, uh, the award that you so much deserve. And all I can say is that if I've touched people in the world, it's because you got me there. So thank you. So here's what I wrote for you that I, I was going to open with, but I never got to it. <laughs> I love life. And that's a sentiment I wish for all human beings. But do you realize the many important implications of such a statement? The implication of the concept, I. This means I am self-aware, that I can think. And in the case with the statement I made about loving my life, it means that I can think abstractly about my life, my past, my present, my future, my pains, my triumphs. And then I express the feeling of love. What does this mean? It means that not only can I have an abstract view of my life and objectively reflect upon it, it also means that I have values and I can have a subjective feeling about my life. It means that my mind not only has the capacity to process perceptions coming in, but from these perceptions, it can form concepts. It can form ideas. It can direct actions. And what's the implication of all of this? It forms my life. That is unless I don't pay attention to my mind and values. And in this case, then my life is formed for me. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the very nature of consciousness, and with that is revealed the critical importance of philosophy. I hope you'll embrace it, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. <laughs>